So back in 2017, my girlfriend and I were in a semi-long distance relationship. I lived in the Orlando area, she lived in Tampa. I would frequently travel with Megabus to Tampa to see her and for concerts. Shortly after this experience, I switched exclusively to Amtrak and didn't regret having to pay a bit more. On this day, however, I had picked up Wendy's before the trip for dinner. I had made my way to the boarding area. I noticed a disheveled older man glaring at me openly. I didn't acknowledge him and instead boarded the bus. I sat near the back of the bus, placed my lone backpack on the seat next to me, and opened my food. As I was eating, I noticed that the same man who had been glaring had boarded and sat across the aisle from me, in the seat closest to the aisle, same as me. We had about two feet of separation. Well, the bus takes off and we're soon on the interstate, headed west. Every time I took a bite of my food, he would grumble. Then he started raising his voice a bit and motioning to me. Then he started near shouting and pointing at my wrapper. I had headphones on and I was comfortably ignoring him by this point. I had worked a full shift at work that day, had headed home, showered, changed, grabbed my packed bag and headed out. So I was tired and hungry. As I finished my food, balled up the wrappers and tossed them into the bag. He became irate, shrieking in Spanish and reached over to me, grabbing the bag and looking inside. When he saw it was empty, he began screaming at me. I bluntly told him to shut up. It was my food. He went silent for a bit, until I saw him rummaging in his bag. He then slipped a hatchet out of the bag, laid it across his lap and smirked at me. My blood ran cold. I'm a big guy, six foot three, 300 pounds. But in that small space, and dealing with a weapon-wielding maniac, I knew I couldn't do shit. I immediately stood up, walked to the driver, and told him about what had happened. The next stop was Lakeland, and we were still about 45 minutes away. That was the only way he could do something. I went back to my seat grabbed my backpack, and fled to the upper level, sitting close to the window at the far back. When we got to Lakeland, I saw him get approached and escorted off the bus. As he stepped off, he stumbled and fell, which is when I realized he was drunk. I'm glad he didn't get the opportunity to hurt anyone on that bus, and I can only hope he was detained after, or separated from his weapon. I live in a small studio apartment. I like my place a lot, even though it has some details that always made me nervous living here. The wall facing the street is just basically a giant window, and I also live on the second floor, so my window is very close to the streets below. Even though that makes me a little uncomfortable, nothing ever really happened, and it just stopped bothering me that much a couple of months after I moved in. Until last week, that is. Last Monday, I woke up around 2am to drink some water. Since the kitchen is right to the side of my front door, I could hear someone coming in from the corridor as I filled a cup. It wasn't coming from another apartment or from the streets. The noise had that very specific reverberation from an empty corridor. I approached the door and I could make out that the sound was actually some trap beat playing on repeat. At first, I thought that maybe it was just some drunk guy messing around with his phone before getting into his apartment. But after laying in bed again, I could still faintly hear the same beat coming from the corridor. It kept playing and playing until I fell asleep about an hour later. Around 7am, I was woken up by someone ringing the doorbell. It was a cop, a bunch of them actually. The landlord and some of my neighbors were also there. Even with the place very crowded, it was hard to miss the trail of blood that went from the corridor window to the far end of the wall. The cop said that someone was leaving for work early in the morning when they came across the blood smears and immediately called the police. He questioned me and the neighbors. The place was scrubbed and we went on with our lives, 
but I couldn't stop thinking about it. Every day I come home and walk over where the blood was, and I wonder what the hell happened in that corridor that night. I was a bit uncomfortable living here before, but now I'm very definitely spooked. To start, let me explain myself. I'm 5 foot 7, 113 pounds, and I was 16 at the time of this encounter. I'm a multi-sport athlete, and I have insomnia. This all happened around 2 a.m. on August 10th of 2019. I had been over to my best friend's place because she had just returned home from a vacation, and she had birthday presents for me. Hoodies and gummies, if you're curious. I had spent almost an hour there already, and wanted to head home as soon as possible, because honestly, my town is scary at night. Drug dealers, murderers, you know the deal. So, I waved goodbye to my best friend, and started walking down her street. I guess a party had just let up, because behind me, at the end of the road, about 20 or 30 yards from where I was standing, there were a couple of men walking across the crosswalk. They were both pretty tall, I'm guessing between 5'11 and 6'3. The two seemed harmless at first when I looked in their direction, but soon they came to a stop. They were both looking at me. At this point, I felt uncomfortable, so I just kept walking. That's when I overheard what one of them said. Hey. That's a girl. At this, I whipped my head around. They were starting to walk in my direction now, and one of the two men had moved over towards the sidewalk, where there was no light. I knew at this point that something wasn't right. I began to pick up my pace. They were still getting closer. I didn't know where the second guy was, but when I looked back, the first guy was still following me down the middle of the road. I think that they were planning to cut me off and try to trap me between the two of them. The minute I was about 13 yards from the T intersection, I started to run, and that's when the yelling started. Oh great, now she's running. I hooked a sharp right and then a left, and I could still hear them behind me. And at this point, all I knew was that I couldn't stop moving. I had to lose them somehow. I was coming up to an apartment building with a small parking lot behind it. There were no lights. I made the split-second decision to veer off into the parking lot. I squeezed myself under one of the cars. I don't know how long I waited there. It could have been a minute, but it felt like a lifetime. I watched two men run past. They didn't bother to check under the cars, which was definitely in my favor. The minute I felt that I was safe, I backtracked and took a different route back to my home. I was too scared to take the main route, in the fear I would have to bump into them. I know what I'm about to say is stupid, but I didn't go to the police. I wouldn't have been able to give a proper description of the man, because I hadn't seen their faces. If there's anything I learned from my experience, it's that no matter who you are, you need to be extremely careful. You can think that the part of town or city that you live in is safe, but that really isn't the case. There is no protective barrier to keep out people with bad intentions. Please, whatever you do, watch your surroundings as if your life depends on it. If I had been listening to my music and not paying attention, I hate to think what could have happened to me. I hope that no one else has to experience the fear I did. It was almost like prey being chased by predators. This happened last October, while I was solo climbing here in Peak in Colorado. And every word is true. Before I left on this trip, I got an email telling me I had a bunch of raid reward points that were about to expire. My kid didn't really need anything so I cashed them in on a badass Tanto-style survival knife that I never would have bought full price. 
I've been living with my parents all summer to help out with my mom's illness, so I was desperate for a bit of solitude. But I knew the trailhead sites would be crowded, even late in the season, because Huron is a popularish 14er. My car had terrible ground clearance, so no way in hell was I getting up to the 4x4 road to the trailhead anyway. I found a spot to park my car off the side before the road gets too rough, and hiked about three-fourths of a mile down what I initially thought was a deer trail. Surprisingly, the trail ended at a prepared campsite next to a beaver pond, level dirt pad, rock fire pit, a few old beer cans. It's almost too perfect. I look around to make sure I'm not in a rancher's backyard or something, but there are no signs or structures visible, and grass was growing in the fire pit. Probably months since someone overnighted here, that's what I figured. Since it was October, it was already sundown, and by the time I got my hammock strung up and cooked dinner, it was pitch dark. The whole time I'd been using my new knife for everything, cutting lengths of paracord for the hammock top, opening my food. Hell, I was making up excuses to use this thing. I wanted to hit the trail early, so I started getting ready for bed right after dinner. I trek off into the woods a bit to hang my bear bag at a safe distance, but when I get back, my knife is gone. I was positive I had left it sitting on the edge of the fire pit, but I tear the whole side apart looking for it anyway. About halfway through, I start getting that prickly feeling that I'm not alone and that I'm being watched. Finally, exhausted and paranoid, I give up. I announce loud enough for anyone at the perimeter of my lights to hear, but quiet enough that it's plausible I'm talking to myself. Well, at least I still have a gun. I'm sure it sounded super lame, and it was a pure bluff. I had no firearms with me whatsoever. I pretend to lay down in my hammock and... After about 20 minutes or so, I hear what sound like faint footsteps headed in the opposite direction of me, down the trail back to the road. I spent the entire night wide awake clutching at my shitty pocket knife. At first light, I break camp and shove everything into the car, then drive my poor car as far up the 4x4 road as I can. I didn't want to have to come back here. It was a beautiful day. I summited ahead of schedule. Shared lunch with some friendly fellow hikers and almost forgot about the whole ordeal. As I walked back to the car, now parked about four to five miles from where I camped, I noticed there was something stuck under the driver's side window wiper, like a parking ticket. It was my knife. There's only one person I've met in my life that I'm absolutely positive was a psychopath, and it was a ten-year-old little girl. This summer after I graduated college, I was living in a house in Berkeley with a few PhD students. It wasn't the best neighborhood, but it wasn't the worst either. There were a few families living in the neighborhood, including the people in the house next to us. It seemed like a reasonably nice two-story house, but on several occasions there were police cars and ambulances outside of the house. We never really questioned why, as police cars weren't a rare sighting in the area, and we'd only ever seen a young girl and her mom at the house, so there was nothing overtly abnormal or concerning. One afternoon, my roommates and I had just finished smoking a joint in our backyard, when we hear a knock at the front door. I open it and it's the mother from next door. I was a bit taken aback, even more so when she says, Hi, I wanted to ask you guys something. I really don't want to have to call the police. At this point, I'm thinking she must have seen or smelled a smoking weed, and while it was Berkeley, it technically hadn't been legalized yet. So I'm thinking we need to apologize and talk our way out of trouble, but then I notice this woman is visibly shaking. She was clearly terrified and said, I just don't know what to do. I'm having a situation with my daughter and I really just need another adult to be there. My roommate Sean and I immediately agreed to go with her while my other roommates look on. 
incredibly confused by whatever the hell's going on. This mother is asking some stone students to be adults. She must be truly desperate for help. Sean and I walk over with her, and she explains that her daughter has some issues, which are currently manifesting as her standing on the roof of their house, threatening to drop her mom's work computer off the edge, or jump herself. Wow. Shit just got super real. Sure enough, we walk up to the driveway to the house, and there is this kid standing on the roof of their two-story house, dangling a MacBook Pro over the side. She's saying in this disturbing, sing-songy voice, Look, mommy, no hands. No hands, mommy. No hands. Sean and I immediately make eye contact. We are both creeped out. This is not a normal kid. The way she's speaking reminds me of the twins from The Shining. She's not crying and doesn't seem remotely distressed. On the contrary, it appears she's enjoying this torment of her mother like it's some kind of sick game to her. The mother starts explaining to us that her daughter has had issues like this for many years. She has a psychiatrist and a therapist, and the mother has called both. They recommended calling the police, but the mother has been through this quite a few times before and doesn't want the child to go through the ordeal of being restrained and taken to hospital yet again. She is frightened and exhausted and doesn't know what to do. So I just start talking to the kid. I tell her about how I used to love climbing on the roof of my house and now I'm into rock climbing and I bet she would love that too. Besides, it's much safer than climbing around the edge of a roof, if you make sure to use the proper gear and safety precautions. And the fact that she's so unsafe right now is really scaring her mom. I told her if she comes down, I'm happy to talk to her more about climbing, as well as show her the pet geckos we have that literally climb up the walls. I'm just pulling things out of my ass at this point. I have no idea what to say or how to mediate a situation like this. I am just trying to diffuse the tension and get her to come down. She is flat out ignoring me at first, continuing to taunt her mother, but eventually she seems to get bored or irritated with my attempts to engage her. She turns around and climbs back towards the window where she got onto the roof. She runs down the stairs and out to meet us, then says in the same weirdly, sing-songy fake, come play with a Stanley voice. I dropped your computer on the roof. And now it's broken. I'm sorry, mommy. Do you forgive me? There was zero remorse whatsoever in her voice. It sounded so disturbing and manipulative. I was blown away that it was coming from a ten-year-old girl and not some demon child from a horror movie. The mother is still shaking and just looks overwhelmed, so I offer to go up and get her computer from the roof. She agrees and escorts me through the house up the stairs with her daughter trailing behind. The girl is clearly irritated with me spoiling her game and repeatedly orders me to leave. I ignore her, climb out the window onto the roof, and the laptop is sitting by a gutter, seemingly unscathed. I climb back through and hand it to the mother. At this point, the girl realized her bluff was called and skipped off to her room. Her mom proceeds to explain to me that the whole thing was triggered by her changing the password to her laptop after the girl logged into it, stole her mother's credit card, and ordered over $2,000 worth of stuff. This girl is 10 years old. She's been pulling stuff like this her entire life, and no one understands why. They had to move the girl's younger sibling into a separate apartment with her father because they were afraid she would hurt him. The mother was crying at this point, saying they really tried their best to get the help she needed, and they're just at their wit's end. I did my best to reassure her, gave her my phone number, and told her to contact me if she needs help in the future. Sean and I got out of there and went back to our house. She never contacted me, and we moved out a few months later.
This happened about a year and a half ago. I was at work, and I ordered DoorDash for myself and my supervisor, since it was our birthday. I was happy to see I had the same driver as last time, as I work in a small building, among other identical buildings, with a convoluted road system in between them all. It can be a little confusing for someone not used to it. I had been watching the map and went outside once he was close by. I stood under a cluster of bright lights into a parking lot, wearing neon yellow. You couldn't miss me. Immediately, I get a call from my driver, asking me to come to him. I look around and don't see anyone, until I walk a couple of yards to the center of the lot. He's sitting on the side of my building by the dumpster, where there is no light. He also has his lights off. I'm thinking what the hell, dude. I start waving my arms and telling him I'm in front of the building. He's on the side. He hangs up and just chills there for a minute. At this point, I'm really annoyed because our food is getting cold, and this guy delivered to me in the exact same spot a week before. Finally, he turns his lights on and comes over to me. As soon as he pulls up, he's speaking another language into his phone, which then translates to English. Something like, Hello, I am practicing my English. I need new friends. Will you be my friend? And then puts the phone towards me. I feel like I'm speaking to a child, because this is inappropriate. I just say, Oh, that's a cool app. And I look at him, waiting. He keeps speaking into the app about needing friends. And I tell him my supervisor is waiting for me. I reach out my hand for the food. He tries to touch my hand and then asks for my number. At this point, the fact that he had tried to get me in the dark, plus his persistence, turned my growing annoyance into fear. I tell him I need the food, and he asks me to get into his car in perfect English. Thank God at this moment, someone in my sister building comes out and makes their way over to the lot. He finally gives me my food and scurries off, which freaked me out. Why, after all that, would he speed off at the sight of another person? Clearly, his intentions were not good. I reported all this to DoorDash at the time, as well as my local police and on social media. And it turns out, he'd done this to someone who lives two miles away from me. She had also ordered late at night and he apparently asked her if she lived alone and if they could hang out while holding her food hostage. DoorDash assured me that they had deactivated him, but his boldness, plus the fact that he seemed to only drive late at night, makes me think he does this a lot and has probably already assaulted someone. So when I was a kid, around 6 to 14, my family and I would often travel to a city, about 38 miles away from our small town, to visit family friends, go shopping, or occasionally visit a few properties that my father owned. One of them was a small house that was previously inhabited by my aunt and her family. One day when we were visiting the city, we were staying at this house for a few hours, as my dad had to conduct a few business deals. My mom wanted to visit a friend, and I wanted to buy some new games. After we were finished, we gathered our things, got in the car, and drove back home, just like usual. Well, about a quarter of the way home, my dad realized he forgot his phone back in that house, so we turned around and drove back. At this point, I was playing games on my mom's phone, because I was bored and had nothing to do. Then, for some reason, I just decided to repeatedly call my dad's phone with my mom's. They told me to cut it off since it was annoying, but being the rebel that I was, I kept calling until they just ignored it. It was not until the car was right on the driveway that my mom asked for a phone back. One more call, I said to her. Fine, she said. So I did just that. And then, hello, I heard answer from the phone. 
It was feminine. I didn't recognize it. My dad's phone was inside that house that he was currently unlocking. Shocked and confused, I hung up. My mom saw me and asked what was wrong, and so I told her what happened. She rushed to my dad, grabbing me by my arm. Someone's in the house, she whispered to my dad. Immediately, he opened the door, and we rushed towards the house. But it was empty, and my dad's phone was in the bedroom that was also locked with the key that only he had. We checked the phone for the missed calls that I made, and considered the possibility that I might have called someone else from my mother's contacts. Turned out that the final call I made had been answered by that very phone. My mom and dad searched the entire house for a possible B&E. They concluded that everything was in order, and there were no signs of forced entry or anyone else in the house besides us. We decided to just leave it behind and go home. My dad justified it by saying it was a thief. There was barely anything to take from there, besides an old TV. If it was a vagrant, then it wouldn't be his problem anymore in a few months. We actually kept that house until I turned 23, and I spent three years living there until I moved out to get my master's degree. To this day, I still don't know who the hell that was, who answered the phone, why couldn't we find them? Well, I suppose I'll never find out. As a young woman who lives alone, I tend to be cautious when it comes to who I open the door for. One evening some time ago, I ordered in some food, and as usual, I requested it to be left outside, as I prefer no contact. So when the guy shows up, he has no problems finding the right place, and I go out to get the food. I get bad vibes from this dude quickly. He waits a few seconds before he hands over the food, and while doing so, he looks me up and down. Then he said, Bet you live alone because you didn't order that much. He said this in a joking way, but I just said nah, then went off into my home and locked the door twice. I was a bit creeped out already and decided to peek outside to see if he left. He hadn't. The delivery dude stood there for a good couple of minutes, checking his phone a bit and also just standing around. He leaves and I relax. Then comes the first call. I can only hear very slight breathing on the other side. No one is speaking, so I hung up. Then there was a text. When can I come over and kiss you? Under the call, no one speaking. I check out the number from the delivery app, and of course it's the creepy delivery guy. Another text asking if I want company tonight. So I blocked the number and tried to contact the delivery company. No luck there. Then I'm getting a call from a hidden number, and it's the same thing. No one speaking on the other side. Now I'm terrified. So I called the police, of course. They showed up pretty quickly, and I showed them everything. They took my statement and went on their way. After they left, I didn't get any more calls or texts but I'm still weary of delivery guys. I did eventually manage to get in contact with the delivery service the next day. I told them what happened. By then, I had already contacted the police. I asked them how this could happen, and the only explanation I received was that the app requires a number to be registered, and that this person most likely just took it from there. They apologized and said they would deal with it, whatever that meant. I have no idea how or why this guy also used the delivery phone for some nighttime harassment. So I just want to clarify, I was 15 and home alone. I lived on a Native American reservation at the time. Shit would happen all the time, hearing things, walking at night you would see shadows, that kind of creepy stuff. The kids would call them skinwalkers. This was during the day. My mom was at work. And as for myself, well, 
I dropped out of school due to a medical condition. So I had this huge window in my room. I'm talking wide. And it took about a whole section of one wall. Just enough space to fit a vanity and my TV on both sides. I was chilly, smoking weed, walking around my room. I showered at one point, so I got changed. All while a man was sitting on a wooden post, directly across from my backyard, watching me. I didn't have curtains. When we first moved in, they had huge ugly blinds hanging up. I tore them down and put up really cool blankets. During the day, I would tie them up, so light would come in. Arizona is a beautiful state, so to see desert every morning, along with the sunrise, is amazing. Hours pass and my mom comes home. We head to Taco Bell. I vividly remember being on Twitter in my room, eating my cheese dias, when all of a sudden the light in the hallway went off. So I figured it was my mom, but then my door opened slightly. My mind was racing at that point. It was about 9.30 at night. My lights were off in my room. The only light was coming from my phone. And I start calling my cat's names. We had three of them, and that's when I see him, a tall man, a red baseball hat and jeans. I was going through a hard time, so I had a depression fit and started screaming and throwing hangers, empty soda cans, anything I could get my hands on, and I screamed for my mom, who was home and in the room next to me. She comes out, flips my light on, and there is no one there. I tell her I'm calling the police. There was a man in my room. So my mother gets a switchblade from our room and walks me through every room upstairs until we look down into the living room from our balcony and see the blanket from our guest room on the floor. That's when my mom looks at me and says to stay back. Being that it was my mom, I held her hand and we end up downstairs in the office room where the window was wide open. To cut to the end, the man was arrested breaking into another home, and when asked about me, he was ready to take me, kidnap me, and he was watching me. The neighbors called 911 because they saw him trying to get into our gated backyard. My mom saved my life. If she wasn't there, I don't know what would have happened. So, I'm home alone. My mom's out visiting family and picking up some stuff. I'm chilling, playing Animal Crossing with my dog Ty, laying on my bed, keeping me company. Ty suddenly bolts up, hackles raised and growling. I heard someone downstairs shout, Hello? And me being stupid, I shouted back. I went downstairs to see two guys outside, looking in through the window. So I went and opened the door to see what they want, since I was expecting a parcel. They immediately started with, Hi, we have a warrant for the electricity meter. And I immediately felt off. You don't get a warrant to check an electric meter, so I did the only thing I could think of. I told them I was underage and home alone, with Ty watching them through the window. I said I'd call my mom, and I shut the door and tried to lock it, but I couldn't. The key wouldn't turn, so I called my mom. I explained what was going on, and I barricaded the door so that no one could move the handle down. After a few minutes, I managed to turn the key and lock the door. I went upstairs to check the cameras, and lo and behold, it showed three men standing outside the door, occasionally looking at the camera and trying to stay hidden. At one point, you can see two of them enter the house then run out and quietly shut the door. This was the time when Ty went running down the stairs. As I kept watching the playback, I saw the van door open and shut, so I think that there were four people. I have no idea who these men were, or how they unlocked the door, and I'm never going to open the door without a weapon nearby. Later on, my mom came back and watched the footage. They brought a dog bar. The one stray catchers use with a long bar and snare at the end of it. She suspected they picked the lock on the front door, so I couldn't lock it and that they could get in. She found the number on the van. The following day, my mom called the company number on the van 
and ripped them a new one. She thinks they were here to install a pay-as-you-go meter for the electric, but nothing has been touched or moved. Ty stayed in my room with me that night and helped me get some sleep. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that one. Leave a like and comment, subscribe if you haven't, and don't forget to turn on notifications so you're always notified when I release a new video. I want to give a shout out to my patrons for supporting the channel, so huge thanks to Christina De La Rosa, Noosh, Lulu Rogers, Fire05, Linda, Shan, Jody, James Gargano, Kathleen Fenton, Sarah P, Elena Renee, Gemma Allen, Monica Levelace, Courtney Maxwell, Alex, and Jill Hutchins. If anyone else wants to check out the perks of my Patreon or any of my other social media, all my links are in the description. I hope you're all doing well, guys, and have a great weekend. I'll see you on the next one.